I see everyone's joining. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first annual International Shared Parenting Day. I'm Teresa Harlow, and I'm going to be your MC and your keynote speaker today. And we've got a great amount of wonderful information for you today. So thank you for joining and taking the time. First off, I'm going to start off with a question because I want to find out a little bit about you. And this is going to be somewhat interactive throughout. So let me bring up our first question. And you should see that on your screen right now. Does somebody see it? Just give me a thumbs up or something. Awesome. Okay, so are you never married to your child's parent, divorced and remain single, or remarried? And I see the answers coming in. And don't worry if you don't get a chance to chime in. We've got so much on this agenda that I may have to cut it short, but it'll give us a good idea of who we're talking to tonight. Okay, and it looks like we've got a good portion of the people have responded. So I'm gonna end that poll and then I'm gonna share the results. And it looks like we have a pretty even distribution right now, at least, with slightly more people that are divorced and remain single. So uh, that gives me some insight, and we'll get more from you as we go on. But I want to introduce you to Don Huben. Don Huben is a professor emeritus of philosophy of the Center for Ethics and Human Values at the Ohio State University. He is also the chairman of the board for the National Parents Organization, who's bringing you this presentation today. And, a non and NPO is a nonprofit that promotes shared parenting and family court reform. On a personal note, Don does a lot of traveling and is currently in Athens, Greece, for the International Council on Shared Parenting Conference. Hello. I'm Don Huben, Chair of National Parents Organization. I want to welcome you to the first annual NPO International Shared Parenting Day event. We created this event to increase awareness of the value of shared parenting and to further NPO's mission of ensuring that when parents live apart, parental separation doesn't lead to parental deprivation. During the next 90 minutes, we'll present different perspectives on shared parenting, its benefits for mothers, its benefit for fathers, and most importantly, is benefits for children. We'll look at some of the most important recent research on shared parenting from a world leading researcher, Dr. William Fabricius of the Arizona State University. And we'll look at the connection between shared parenting and parental alienation <laughs> by another leading researcher, Dr. Jennifer Harmon of Colorado State University. Ned Holstein, founder and chair emeritus of NPO, will announce the awards named in his honor for shared parenting research. We'll meet a couple from Rhode Island who were presented with NPO's Partners in Parenting Award because they provide a model for how to parent their children when they're living apart. And we'll explore ways to make shared parenting work even when the separated parents aren't the best of friends with Teresa Harlow, author of Combative to Collaborative, The Co-Parenting Code. Those of us who have been involved for years in the shared parenting movement sometimes become frustrated with the slow pace of progress. But I want to encourage you, the times are changing. Laws are changing, court practices are changing, and most importantly, parents are coming to recognize that when they separate from the other parent, the most important thing they can do to benefit their children is to ensure that both parents are fully engaged in raising the children. There'll come a time, not too many years in the future, when we'll look back and wonder how we could have ever thought it made sense to marginalize one parent in a child's life just because the parents are no longer living together. I hope you'll join NPO to help hasten that day. Go to our website, sharedparenting.org, to learn more. And please enjoy the first ever NPO International Shared Parenting Day event. Thank you. It really never has made sense, right? You all know that. So next up, we're going to hear from Matt Hale, and Matt Hale is going to share with us a little about the history of Shared Parenting Day. Matt is the former chair of NPO Kentucky and currently a member of the National Parents Organization Board of Directors. He's one of the nation's leaders of the Shared Parenting Movement and the creator of Shared Parenting Day. 
Matt also wrote the initial draft of the nation's first permanent shared parenting presumption law in Kentucky and led the effort for its passage. Matt likes old movies so much that he named his daughters after movie stars, Ava Gardner, Bridget Bardot, and Sophia Loren. Let's hear what Matt has to say. Hi, I'm Matt Hale, National Parents Organization's Vice Chair and Creator of Shared Parenting Day. When Kentucky became the first state to legally presume a child's best interest is equal time with two fit parents, I knew it was big and bound to get bigger. So the idea to create shared parenting came to me so that it would help spread Kentucky's law to other states. Right after Kentucky's law ceremonial signing, I approached Governor Matt Bevan and said, we'd like you to consider making April 26th Kentucky Shared Parenting Day. I tell you what, I love it, he responded. Then he directed me to fill out the official request form. I kept the news quiet from the K Kentucky volunteers that I call the Kentucky Heroes and everyone else too, just in case it didn't happen. Then the governor's office informed me that the proclamation was ready. I was very excited, so I went to get it in person, of course. On the way, I let the heroes and National Parents Organization leadership know the great news. They were overjoyed and stunned because I hadn't shared it with anyone. Next, I chose yellow as Shared Parenting Day's color. Since the sunlight of Shared Parenting Day, April 26th, follows the darkness of Parental Alienation Day, April 25th, I wanted sunlight's color. And yellow is the traditional color for family reunification like yellow ribbons. The news of Kentucky's proclamation spread rapidly and so did the excitement. The following year, NPO's Linda Reitzel successfully lobbied for Missouri to proclaim April 26th as Shared Parenting Day. I knew then that it would stick. Uh, next, NPO's Candace Harrison got Arizona to proclaim the day, as did uh, NPO's Andrew Marshall in Maryland and uh, Leanna Micah in Massachusetts. The following year, State Rep Tom Pischke got the day proclaimed in South Dakota, and soon after, the city of El Paso joined in. Today is also a day to say thank you to all of you. Thank you for your hard work in your quiet moments or while you're doing public work. Uh, one day, every day, we'll sell, every state will celebrate Shared Parenting Day. And more importantly, one day, every state will have a shared parenting law like Kentucky's. We're winning, so keep up the good work. And I did wear yellow today just for that. All right. So next up, another chance for you to interact with us. This time... I'm going to ask you, how do you rate the cooperation between you and your co-parent? Rate it on a scale of one to five with five being the best. And I see we have a scale of zero to five. So I guess the zeros are probably the worst. <laughs> okay, go ahead and make your selection now. And we may not let these run till they're completely done, just so you know. All right. All right, and I'm gonna go ahead and share the results. I didn't see a chance to uh, end that. So hopefully everybody got a chance to uh, do that. So it looks like we could use some help. Okay, well, never fear. I'm Teresa Harlow, if you didn't hear that already. I've been a co-parent for 23 years, a step-parent for 15 of those. And I'm on my third business, third marriage, and I've done three tours of duty in corporate America. Yes, that's what I call them. So now I'm a speaker, a co-parenting coach, an author, and a mediator with a passion for helping people to reconcile combative relationships that keep you from living your best life and achieving your dreams. So with that, I have to tell you, I also harbor an incredibly fearful uh, urgency out of our future with artificial intelligence. Because, well, let's face it, we haven't really gotten spell checked down all that great yet. Am I right? <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and bring up my presentation and take you through the first part of that. And a lot of you said that your relationship with your co-parent probably looks more like what we have going on on the left than on the right. 
hopefully I got that right because everything's kind of in reverse. But, you know, I get it. Co-parenting can be difficult. But let's not say you've failed. As Thomas Edison said, you haven't failed. You've just found 10,000 ways that don't work. So if you haven't gotten it right, stick with me here today. When my son's father and I divorced, he was six years old. Now he's 29, and he'll tell you that he had a happy childhood. It wasn't always easy. We didn't always get it right. But it did happen, and it took intention, focus, and perseverance. Now, this fine lady is my mother, 92 years old, Helen. And let's just say we didn't always have a great relationship. When I was a teenager, I was sure my mom didn't know what she was talking about. A lot of us felt that way, right? I mean, she was out of touch, old fashioned, didn't understand me and certainly couldn't help me with any of my problems. And then I went off to college, I got married, I became a parent. And one day I woke up and realized I was saying things to my son that my mom said to me. And I realized, I am my mother, sort of like that progressive commercial. But really, if we look back on the lessons our parents taught us when we were young, we begin to realize that, well, they might have been right about a lot of it. And I want to share with you today or remind you of some lessons that you probably learned when you were a child and see how you can use those today in your relationships to help you move from combative to collaborative with them. So today I'm sharing with you my four steps that'll help you do that. They are civility, communication, caring, and then practice because practice makes perfect. Civility, my mom would say, if you have nothing nice to say, don't say anything. In communication, she'd always encourage me to talk it out. And when it came to caring, she said to live by the golden rule and treat others the way you want to be treated. Now, I've used these steps in all of my most difficult relationships, and it really worked for all of them. Okay, except for one. But you can't win them all. And even if you don't, you'll feel better knowing you tried. And sometimes it just takes practice and time and maybe even a lot of time. So you're gonna notice my mom's face throughout this presentation, so get used to it. So let's start with civility. How do you practice civility with someone who doesn't act civilized? Well, my mom has three lessons for you when dealing with the less civilized souls among us. One, focus on what's important. Two, reassess your situation or look for the silver lining as she would put it. And three, exercise restraint. As I said before, if you have nothing nice to say, you know the rest. So let's go a little deeper. Ralph Waldo Emerson said, you become what you think about all day long. In other words, what you focus on. If you don't want to continue the conflict, then don't focus on it or what you don't like about the other person. I say, if you want to solve a problem, don't focus on what's wrong. Focus instead on what you can control and what's important, your purpose. And you can use the questions that you see on the screen right now to do that. And I'll bring them a little closer so you can see them. Things like, what purpose does this relationship with my co-parent serve? And why is it important to preserve that relationship? Are they the gateway to your child? And you can see there's quite a few different questions you can ask yourself to remind yourself over and over again to focus on what's important. How about reassessing your situation? So the old man, let me bring that back up for you to see a little clearer. The old man says, in the moonlight, your teeth ju look just like pearls. And the wife says, who's Pearl? And what were you doing in the moonlight with her? Now, this is where reassessing a situation can come into play. 
Are you making assumptions about what you're hearing from the other person? Are you reading more into it than what was intended? And what else could be going on with them that caused them to lash out at you to begin with? Maybe it wasn't even you, you were just in the line of fire. So let's reassess a couple pictures I found that were quite intriguing. Take a look at this one. What color are the balls in this image? Are they blue, green, and some kind of pinkish, orangey thing? Well, look again very closely just at the color in the background and look from one to another ball, and you might notice something. They're all the same color. How about this one? Is this a dog head just out there on the pavement? Is it a dog submerged in cement? Or is something else going on here? Well, let's hope so. And it turns out, if you look really closely, that cement in the background is at a lower level. This dog is resting his head on a ledge. So here are some common co-parenting issues that you might encounter throughout your uh, journey. And let's take a minute to rethink them. So in this first one, my co-parent is always calling my son when he's with me. And you think, Geez, this is my time, right? But you could alternatively consider that you're glad that your co-parent actually cares to call. I know it can be annoying, but this can help you reset your perspective. How about my co-parent isn't following our parenting agreement? So frustrating, he's irresponsible. Versus, you know what? This plan just isn't working. And last, my child says her step-parent is mean. I've been at the step parent and I was probably uh, accused of this once or twice. And you think, yeah, she's probably mean versus, you know what? Maybe my child's just telling me what she thinks I want to hear. Exercising restraint. Just saying. Okay. So there are some strategies for exercising restraint that you can employ using silence, picking your battles, maintaining your perspective. Why? Because maintaining that relationship with your co-parent is your gateway to your child and your personal happiness, believe it or not. But look, a word of caution when we're talking about restraint a lot of people put things in writing for documentation purposes, but be careful. Don't put anger in writing. Don't memorialize your bad behavior. So I'll bring these up closer real quick here. And then I'm going to flip to the next slide and ask you, how will you exercise restraint? Just type it in the chat. What do you think you could do to exercise restraint when you feel triggered by your co-parent? Walk away, take deep breaths. I like that screen name, bite my tongue. Absolutely. Okay. Now we're going to move on. That's the end of my first segment. And we've got a whole bunch of other speakers to get to, namely Warren Farrell. So let me just turn this off here. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about Warren. Warren is an author and an activist who has been a prominent advocate for shared parenting for over 20 years. He is the co-author of the book, The Boy Crisis, plus six other books. And he's the former board member of the National Organization for Women, known as NOW. Honestly, Warren's bio is quite impressive, including interviews with Tony Robbins, Oprah Winfrey, and Barbara Walters. So I'd encourage you to learn more about him. Let's hear what Warren has brought for us today. Uh, I'm, I'm Warren Farrell, and um, I, my career started uh, with being involved with the uh, National Organization for Women in New York City. I was on their board of directors and spoke all around the world on women's issues and the importance of men being secure enough to um, accept and encourage and uh, understand how to benefit uh, from women becoming more uh, powerful, more um, able to be able to decide to do whatever they wanted to do in their life. And, um, and then that led to my speaking around the world on these issues. And um, eventually I began to see that there were people that were 
coming up to me and saying that boys were having problems and, um, and men were having some problems. And I started paying attention to that and putting men on my radar. And I was also started some 300 um, men's groups and um, about 200 women's groups and was listening to the feedback from those. And yet I felt that um, there was something else going on that when I did the research for a book called The Boy Crisis, I found that um, the boy crisis often um, emanated from uh, divorce situations. It's definitely true that the courts and the legal system um, magnifies the problem, magnifies the anger. Um, you go to court and over and over again, when I've been an expert witness in court, I hear the mother saying terrible things about the father, the father saying terrible things about the mother. You can't help but come away angrier at that. They became adversaries, which is exactly the opposite of what they needed to become, uh, which is people who were learning how to uh, create a model of good communication for this, that their uh, children would be able to bring uh, to their life and then also their, to their children as well. When I did the research for the boy crisis, one of the things I discovered was what were the things that were absolutely essential for allowing children to do about as well in a divorce situation as they would in an intact family. Uh, the, the first thing that I found that it was absolutely crucial for um, the children to be exposed to and for the family to have is an equal amount of time with the mother and the father. Um, at least 40% um, with each parent. Um, when it gets to be less than that, there is considerable harm. Uh, the closer it gets to 50%, the more the children uh, benefit from that. One of the problems is the, the deep history that we have in the last century or so of s seeing the mother as being the natural parent. Uh, we used to have a tender years doctrine uh, that still exists um, even in people's minds and judges' minds, even when it doesn't exist in the law, um, that, that just basically has a bias. You know, I may have held some of those biases before I started my research from 20, 25 years ago, but the more I dug into it, uh, the more I realized that the children um, need both parents um, and they, they, they feel abandoned by a parent that sees them less. Uh, they feel hurt, they wonder what's wrong with them, and they don't get, and especially boys, don't get the role model of what it's like to be a good, constructive, loving dad. Shared parenting is so crucial because the children do better in about 50 different areas of growth and development when they have about an equal amount of time with both dad and mom. Um, first of all, they're much more likely to be productive. They're much more likely to feel like they're not abandoned. So therefore, they're much less likely to be depressed. So they, they get one type of parenting from the mother, one type of parenting from the father. Every judge needs to understand that mothers and fathers do tend to have different parenting styles and that the children who do the best do the best when they have checks and balanced parenting. And to understand that both of them contribute to children's development in very important ways. Uh, that dad style parenting like roughhousing, like teasing, like risk taking, uh, those are what styles of parenting that are not easily understood by a, by a mom. And not because there's something wrong with the mom or the mom doesn't really care about the children. She cares about the children enormously. But those dad styles of parenting um, do not come naturally to a mother. But each of those styles of parenting have very important functions in balance that are not being uh, understood by almost any um, lawyer or judge and very few parents. One of the things I, that really surprised me in doing the research for the boy crisis was how much data there is showing the positive values of when fathers are involved, judges, and lawyers need to know that they are not a functional part of helping mothers and fathers. What is the court system that exists now is not helping what you both want to help, which is the next generation of children be as functional as possible. So it's interesting because uh, Warren was always a women's rights advocate, and he's come full circle on his understanding of the need for both parents to be heavily involved. Next, we're going to hear from Bill Fabricius. Bill Fabricius is a professor of psychology at Arizona State University and a leading researcher on co-parenting. 
and of father in, and of father involvement. His research has been published in numerous academic journals and has helped to shape the field of co-parenting studies. And Bill lives in sunny and hot Phoenix, Arizona. Hello, everyone. My name is William Fabricius. I'm a professor of psychology at Arizona State University. And I'm happy to talk with you today at this National Parents Organization webinar. Uh, last week, I was contacted by um, people from the Canadian Association for Equal Parenting Time. And they wanted to talk with me about our experience in um, changing the um, child custody statutes here in Arizona. And we had a really good discussion. So I thought that that might be a good um, a good thing to share with you. So I will try to uh, you know summarize the discussion we had. Um, they gave me a little bit of background uh, about their efforts uh, towards equal parenting time in Canada. Um, currently, they're engaging volunteers from across uh, Canada to meet with their uh, local parliamentarians. Um, the, they, they speak about um, social science research uh, in these meetings. They've been doing this for a number of years with not too much success. In 2014, apparently, um, a, a bill was defeated in the House of Commons, and uh, a couple of years ago, a similar bill uh, was also de defeated. Uh, they talked about the typical kinds of opposition and hurdles uh, that we all experience uh, um, from, uh, you know, opposition from domestic violence uh, prevention organizations, uh, resistance from uh, the bar associations. Um, so they had questions for me about um, what strategies did we use to successfully change the law in Arizona? Um, how did we deal with opposition? And uh, so what I told them in terms of strategies, I think the first thing I said was that apparently the, the kinds of things they'd been doing weren't really working too well. So it might be time to change approach. Um, and my suggestion was that they find people in Canada who are influential people in the family law community or, you know, the kind of people who are change makers and simply have them co contact their counterparts in Arizona. Um, we've been living with our equal parenting time bill for 10 years now, and the enthusiasm is very high in the state for how well the law is working. Um, the strategies that have been developed um, for the, for sort of individualizing equal parenting time plans for families, for educating families about the benefits of it and motivating them to, um, you know, to agree to it and, um, and manage it, uh, have all been developed over the last 10 years. So the, the judges, the attorneys, the mental health people, the uh, conciliation court staff and directors in every county have just a wealth of both enthusiasm and experience, and they are willing to talk with their counterparts in other states um, and, and, and also state legislators um, about, you know, how well the law is working and how to implement such a law. So I really think that at this point in time, that kind of approach um, is really beneficial and, and something that, that all you folks could think about tapping into. Um, uh, we've published a, an evaluation of the law here. Um, the, public, the, the, the feeling in four years after the implementation of the law was very positive, and that has continued. There have been no attempts to change the law. We've had several appeals court rulings that um, have affirmed the law. Um, so I think that's sort of the way to go nowadays. Um, they wanted me to uh, give a sort of a presentation about the, so the research that backs up um, the benefits of equal parenting time. But, you know, I think that having an outside person come in and do, you know, do a, do a seminar or, or a workshop uh, won't be as effective at this point in time, given that we have um, 
you know, we have evidence that the law, this kind of law does work. Um, and, and I think it's especially important that if you folks can identify change makers in your states that have questions, um, they can ask them of the Arizona people. They can get the real answers about how it actually works. We don't have to worry about, you know, hypothetical worries that, uh, you know, such a law would unleash, you know, all sorts of pandemonium because it's not a hypothetical anymore. You really can't argue with success. So in terms of uh, their questions about what strategies we use and um, how we dealt with opposition, I think this can be useful because what we did in Arizona is we worked with the opposition. And so I suggested to the Canadian people, identify your opposition and work with them bring them to the table, give them a piece of the pie. That's what we did here. We formed, we had a, a, a large statewide committee and we brought everybody together to reform the entire child custody statute. And everybody had a, uh, a piece of the pie in the sense of being able to, um, you know, to 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 identify changes, uh, modernizations in the statute from their point of view. And so especially the anti-domestic violence uh, organizations, you know, I brought them to the table and we made sort of a, <laughs> we made sort of a grand bargain. And that was that if we modernize the uh, domestic violence language in the child custody statute, they agreed that then in that case, they would have no objection to equal parenting time. Um, so if we tightened up the, their concerns about, um, about domestic violence, then um, they agreed that in cases without domestic violence, certainly equal parenting time is best for children. So that's sort of how we engaged our critics, uh, listened to them, brought them in to the process, um, made them central to the whole process. Um, we identified common grounds. I think this is what everyone can do with look at your opposition, talk with them. You have common ground. You're all trying to do what's best for children and um, find out what their concerns are and find a way to uh, address those concerns along with equal parenting time. And I think, I think that might be a very you know, a, a strategy that can be transferred to lots of other states. Um, you know, if they're worried about domestic violence, there may be groups in your locales or states that are particularly interested in gender equality. Equal parenting time is a beautiful gender equality issue. So you can find ways to do that, I think. Um, in our case, we allowed, or, or it happened, that the the people who were most you know, worried about equal parenting time, they actually suggested the language that's in our bill. In our bill, the, the language is that the court shall maximize the parenting time uh, at both parents' homes. And I've, I'm often asked, why didn't we, you know, explicitly state um, a rebuttable legal presumption? Well, there were two reasons. We uh, implemented our law 10 years ago. Uh, we were the first. And uh, it just seemed like it would raise too many possible objections to have explicit language about presuming equal parenting time. Plus, the language about maximizing was suggested by um, our typical opponents. And so once they had their language in the bill, that's really a great way to, for, to give them buy-in uh, to the bill. So we found that since then, the law is really functioning. The courts are really functioning with a de facto presumption of equal parenting time. Um, and that's just avoided all the hassles associated with arguments about rebuttable presumptions. <clears throat> so in Arizona, it's very clear that the courts are starting with, th that equal parenting time is sort of the assumed starting point uh, rather than a rebuttable legal presumption. But in point of fact, it works the same way. Um, so what, there were some things I think in Arizona that made it um, that, that that we were sort of lucky to have or fortunate at that time 
that these things, I think, really made the, uh, the process work. We had infrastructure, we had groundwork, and we had impetus. So I think the infrastructure was we had a state level uh, committee that had been in existence for years that was a family law advisory committee that brought together a large uh, group of people by gubernatorial, gubernatorial appointment uh, representing all points of view on family law. So we have already had a committee structure. And secondly, in terms of groundwork, I had been able to train the, uh, especially the judges in the state over the years on the emerging research on equal parenting time. So and I could tell uh, from polling the different workshops that I had, I could tell that the judges were on board pretty quickly. Um, judges are smart people. And presenting the research to them, I think, allowed them to, you know, um, go with their, with everybody's feeling that somehow equal parenting time is best. The research, I think, um, sort of allowed them to uh, get on board with that idea. And so I knew that we laid the groundwork with educating the judges. And then in terms of impetus, it so happened at the time that there were two state senators who were going to drop a bill, um, have some type of bill reforming um, either uh, sort of legal custody or parenting time. And the impetus came from a particular father who had, uh, had a really bad experience. Um, but he was able to, to sort of get his state senators um, really interested in doing some type of reform. So we had that as an impetus, um, and that allowed us to you know, take on the issue of a major rev revision of the statutes by bringing everyone together. In the final end, we, had spent, we spent most of our time in our committee um, working out new modern language regarding uh, domestic violence. And that took the bulk of the time. Um, and we let that pr process play out. Uh, I, I had always thought there were some good ideas in that new language, but it it really went it really went too far, and it didn't have a lot of it, it didn't really garner a lot of support. Um, and so, in the end, it turned out that the senators who were going to drop the bill um, at the end um, sort of took out the uh, the new language on. Uh, you know, domestic violence, and it, it was language mostly around coercive control. Um, so in the end, that language was struck, but by then there had been no opposition to the equal parenting time parts of the law. So um, we actually had the law passed almost unanimously here. So again, I would just suggest that if anybody wants to contact me, I can put, I can put people in touch with um, people that they could talk to in Arizona to answer their questions. So I think a, a good strategy would be identify those people in your state um, who have influence in the family law community, let them talk with their counterparts in Arizona, ask any questions they have. And I think then, again, uh, you know, working with identifying your opposition, identifying common ground, bringing them to the table, um, I think that's probably a good way to go at this point in time. So. If anybody has any questions, you can certainly feel free to contact me. All right, thank you. So you have to bring the people to the table that you have disagreements with and figure out why that is. Um, unfortunately, I know that some people are really um, challenged by that, but it is your best way forward. I wanna do something fun now. So we have some free giveaways tonight. And the first is, uh, well, we've got several tickets to give away for the International Council on Shared Parenting's upcoming conference in Athens, Greece. Okay, now we're not sending you to Athens, Greece, but you will receive tickets to attend virtually. Um, so to do this, here's what I wanna do. I wanna give you a trivia question and whoever answers either correctly or comes closest within the time frame I give you, which is going to be very arbitrary, um, will win the the tickets. And we'll we'll give away a couple of them because I think I'm maybe one behind here. I was supposed to do this a little bit ago. 
Uh, so maybe the, the people that come uh, first and second closest to this question. And your question is, as of 2022, what percentage of U.S. first marriages end in divorce? And look, no one's watching. You can Google it. But uh, what percentage of U.S. first marriages end in divorce? And I see some answers coming in. You guys are close. I haven't seen the answer yet. Oh, somebody was really close. Two of you were really close. Oh, and there's the answer. Okay, so I think we've got our winner. So the first one to give the exact answer, I believe, is Jason Hoke. Jason, congratulations. You are the winner of a free ticket to virtual Athens, Greece for the International Council on Shared Parenting's upcoming conference on May 5th, 6th, and 7th. And I am speaking at that as well. And I think we had somebody come in with 42. And I'm going to tell you that uh, someone from National Parents Organization, well, actually, Marcy, who's on this call, will be probably direct messaging you to make arrangements for you to get those tickets. Okay. So next up, we have a word from our sponsor, Onward. And uh, this event would not be possible without their support. So please listen to a little bit about the Onward app. Meet Onward, the best way to manage and track all of your co-parenting expenses. It's as simple as adding an expense to the app along with how you want to split it. Once that's done, both you and your co-parent can settle the payments right on the app, where Onward keeps track of everything. So you can focus on what really matters. Focus on what really matters. <laughs> All right, so next up we have Emma Johnson. Emma is the founder of Moms for Shared Parenting, an act activist group that aims to make 50-50 equally shared care of children the norm. She is a strong advocate for the benefits of shared parenting for moms and for women as a whole. Emma is also the founder of something called Wealthy Single Mommy. Hi, my name is Emma Johnson, and I'm founder of Moms for Shared Parenting, which is really a media project uh, where I aim to leverage my experience with media and marketing to speak to women to help make the larger movement more successful in making equal parenting presumptions the norm, mainly in our culture. I came to this project after many years. My business is a, a blog called uh, WealthySingleMommy.com. And I just, over many years, have heard from thousands and thousands of moms who, who are very frustrated because they feel like they do all the work, right? And this is echoes what's happening with partnered moms, married moms, but these single moms just completely overwhelmed, don't feel like they can thrive professionally, personally, because they do all the work. I had a hard time figuring out how to fit into the movement, which was really uh, dominated by men, white men, politically conservative men who are very, very angry about the fact that their rights were being violated as fathers. And meanwhile, all of these moms felt like their rights were being violated because they had all the responsibility. So rights and responsibility. How could we equalize parenting rights and responsibility? Both moms and dad having equal rights and taking equal responsibility. So just a snapshot of some of the things I've worked on. Um, just literally this week, I am wrapping up the manuscript for a, a book coming out in March 2024 uh, with Sourcebooks, the publisher uh, advocating. It's a, it's a manifesto advocating for equal parenting. I commissioned a, a short animated video speaking to moms about the realities of being overwhelmed as a single mom. And why equal parenting, while it might be uncomfortable now, why we were never conditioned to think this is an option, is really best for everybody. So that has gotten a lot of airtime. Um, I also very proud of a survey project I did where 
I surveyed 2,500 single moms and about their income, about their feelings about equal parenting time and the parenting schedules that they actually have and found that a direct correlation between women who do have equal parenting schedules and the income that they make and also attitudes. Women, the majority of women do want and support equal parenting schedules. How do we connect with these women? How do we do that? Well, first of all, it's you know marketing 101, messaging 101. You have to meet people where they are. Um, this has to be, I get you, I get it. I, as a single mom myself, I think even most moms can empathize feeling overwhelmed by having to do it all and being resentful of your kid's dad for not doing his share. That is a very real feeling we have to acknowledge. I'm not going to go right wing. This movement has been branded only right wing. I am a progressive feminist. There's room and a need for the entire political spectrum, but it is not serving us and it is not serving the work that I'm doing to get my work published in extreme right wing publications, fringe publications. So I've gotten my uh, shared parenting work published in Elle magazine, for example. CNBC did a whole segment on this. Parents Magazine has been very friendly to us. They're a wonderful mainstream, neutral, politically neutral uh, a publication, NPR. We don't need to be passing laws if we had good culture change. And it doesn't have to be an either or, but I will highlight, for example, Denmark is a leader in the equal parenting space. They have a presumption of equal parenting, but there's no law. They just do it culturally. So um, that's what I hope to bring to the movement. I am all ears if people want to reach out and commiserate and brainstorm and do some projects together. I'm just, I really want to submit myself to being the most useful to this movement as possible. So it's interesting to hear that perspective, right? But it's useful to meet people where they're at. I'm going to ask you all another question now. So get ready for another poll to come up on the screen. And if you would tell me, do you currently have a shared parenting agreement with your co-parent? And it doesn't have to be 50-50, but just answer yes, no, somewhat. I guess that's the less than 50. And we'll give that just a minute for people to respond. And you should be able to click on the response right on your screen. Okay. We've got kind of low participation. Hopefully all of you are seeing it. The poll said it has closed. Well, that's interesting. Hmm. Relaunch it. Let me, let me do that again. Sorry. If you already uh, put your uh, answers in, try it again. <laughs> there we go. That's much better. I think I'm click happy. I probably clicked on, no, I didn't click. It just went away. Okay. Well, we got quite a bit more in terms of results that time. So the slightly more of you have a shared parenting agreement than don't have it. And some of you said you kind of have one. So I'm not really sure what that means, but hopefully have, you have a parenting plan. Okay. I scooted over because I was told that um, I was hiding behind my slide. So hopefully this works better. Let's take a look. Oh yeah, that's much better, isn't it? Okay, so we're gonna move on to my second of my three C's of collaboration. And that is communication. Talk it out, mom says. And it would have been nice if mom would have also reminded me that I need to reconcile that with the exercising restraint part, but I had to figure that out on my own as it turns out. So what does she mean by talk it out? Well, mom is direct. Okay. So you really do have to temper this with exercising restraint, but open your ears, meaning to listen, and honesty is the best policy were the things I heard over and over from her. So we have two ears and one mouth for a reason. And uh, we should use them proportionally, right? 
but how often do you introduce yourself to someone and you were focused so much on saying your name that you didn't even listen to what they said? It happens and I do it. And you really have to be intentional about this. So what are some things people do that make you think they're not listening? You can type it in the chat. People look at their watch, they're looking at their phone, maybe they're looking away. Or there's always the person in a, in a business meeting, for instance, that's unable to answer a question when you ask them. Um, so we have to exercise active listening. Letting someone know you're listening lets them know you care about what they're saying. Visually nodding, um, or if it's verbal only, using um, phrases like, I see, or hmm, or wow, no way. Anything that lets them know that you're paying attention, you can repeat their words. And that's helpful if maybe you have a dialect difference with somebody. So you'll notice that a lot of what I'm telling you tonight applies to relationships beyond your co-parents. So I hope you're getting that. Um, you can also paraphrase. And paraphrasing is just a way of restating the whatever they said to you and using different words to do that. Another variation on that would be to ask follow-up questions. It's a great way to clarify that you understand what they intended to convey to you. So let's do a real quick exercise. Paraphrase the following sentence for me. Dad says, I can't pick Joey up Friday. And mom's going to reply here. So do you have any ideas on how mom might reply to paraphrase what dad said? And I'm not sure if you're able to type in the chat. Okay. <laughs> Dad's a deadbeat. Come on, Kurt. <laughs> that may be what she's thinking. Hopefully she doesn't say that, but she might, right? Yeah, so... The idea is, and, and I think Sean's got it here. He can't take time to pick him up. Well, okay. You were kind of on the same track as what I was going to say here, but not quite. So mom could say, so you're not taking him this weekend? And he could say, I'm not available. Yeah, I have to go out of town for work or whatever. Terrible excuse, by the way. Um, Should have thought of that. But second... Um, he might say something like, well, no, I'm available, but I need help getting him to me. So now she's clarified understanding, right? Okay. So you get the idea of paraphrasing. Okay. Asking questions. Sometimes you get so irritated with someone, you just hear what they say, you're ticked off by it, and you don't bother to ask that follow-up question to really dig into it. You just want to get away from them, right? But when you continue the conversation with questions, you keep that dialogue going. You may learn useful information and it shows you care about this conversation and this relationship. And you really get more practice the more you engage with someone whom you have conflict with. I know it's uncomfortable, but practice does make perfect. Okay, let's talk about honesty. Be honest, and dogs and pets in general reveal they're guilty very outwardly. I love those shame pictures and videos on Facebook and so forth. But what are some other forms of dishonesty? Blaming others? Who has a sibling? Ever been blamed for doing something your brother or sister did? There's always the person at work that takes credit for someone else's idea. And then you've got the trail of deception, which complicates life. It makes it hard to maintain like where you're at in the, in the storyline, right? Think Breaking Bad or Ozark. How in the world do you keep all that straight? It's just easier to be honest. And there are those who misrepresent the facts or withhold inconvenient information. Now, you may be the target of this stuff. But if you don't want to be the target of dishonesty, your first um, line of defense is to earn their trust and demonstrate honesty. Be trustworthy. 
But I do have a word of caution because honesty can be weaponized. So if you're going to be honest, when you're being honest, handle it with care. And finally, I want to bring these a little closer so you can see some of these um, ideas. If you are receiving the, or, or you're at the end, the receiving end, excuse me, of poor communication, are you helpless? No, you are not. There are so many things you can do. Just look at all these options you have when faced with hostility, lack of communication, and dishonesty. So take control of it. Okay. I'm going to bring that back down out of the way. And we're going to move on to Andre Rainey. And Andre is the former mayor of Peekskill, New York, and a strong advocate for shared parenting and family court reform. He's been involved in various social justice initiatives and is committed to improving the lives of families and children. On a personal note, Andre loves jet skiing and dolphins and believes all children should swim with one, a dolphin that is. My name is Andre Rainey. I'm the former mayor of Peekskill, New York, current chair of the New York Affiliate National Parents Organization and a proud father of three beautiful children, Zylon, Tanaya, and Zanaida. And I support shared parenting, especially in the state of New York. Um, I support shared parenting for several reasons. You know, one of those main reasons right now, especially is, is it helps eliminate the idea of, of gender roles and, and the stereotypes uh, of what parenting is. You know, there was many, many moons ago, actually not too far ago, but many moons ago when women weren't allowed to work. They, they had to stay home and, and, and be housewives or um, caretakers for the children or for the sick, you know. And the fathers were known as the breadwinners, the, the ones who were out late working and out early in the morning going to work just to provide for the children and the family. And fortunately, those days are are behind us now. Fathers are anxious to be caretakers for their children. They're anxious to be involved in their children's lives. They're anxious to to to, to feed their children, to change their children, to bathe their children. I, I know this because I do it. Uh, just as much so, mothers are anxious to work. They're anxious to have decent jobs or good paying jobs to provide for their family. There's no gender specific role when it comes to parenting anymore. And shared parenting helps promote that. Just as importantly, the economic benefits of it. You know, when you have parents that separate from each other or divorce from each other, there's, there's this consistent battle and you have to have a, a, a decent amount of funding. You know, you have to be in a very set financial space in order to afford an attorney that's going to fight for you the way an attorney probably should in most cases. And it's unfortunate because in the black and brown community especially, you know, the majority of the black and brown community are, are, are in the poverty line or below. And finding an attorney is, is difficult. You know, it's, it's challenging, it's expensive. It's, you know, sometimes people just can't get it and they give up and the children suffer. You, you can't afford an attorney or you're appointed an attorney and attorneys are usually kind of friends with each other or associates with one another. So the fight is not really a fight. It's just kind of who can say the most witty statements on record to get whatever it takes for one of the parents to become a custodial parent and one parent to become a visiting parent. Uh, another reason I support shared parenting is because it promotes positivity with the children and it promotes a positive relationship with both parents after separation or divorce. It allows both parents to be loved and respected. You know, when one parent becomes a visiting parent and one parent becomes a custodial parent, the children grow up with that mentality that one parent is a parent that was there and one parent was a parent that was there every once in a while. And there's oftentimes you don't get the same respect as the other parent from the children. They don't look at you as a parent, they look at you as a person that just came around every once in a while or on occasion. Shared parenting allows the children to look at both parents as parents. They're both playing equal roles in raising the child. And in our communities where so many children are, are, are left without opportunity and left without, you know, financial safety. They're just growing up in difficult times. There's there's nothing more beneficial to these children than understanding 
understanding the structure of family and having both parents in their lives. Shared parenting also promotes positive relationships between the two parents. Once you go to court, in most cases, it's parent versus parent, attorney versus attorney. There's not really um, an agreement of we have to do what's right for the children. It's we have to prove who's wrong on record. And that, that hurts. And as a person who was victim of it, my mother left my biological father when I was two years old. And I didn't see my biological father again or my sister until I was 17. And I didn't even know that my father who raised me, I didn't even know that he wasn't my real father until I was 17 years old when I met my biological father. And that created trauma for my biological father. He, he, he still has so much hate and hurt in his heart towards my mother and even towards women period as a whole. And it took a long time for my sisters to heal because they were raised to believe that their brother was kidnapped and stolen. You know, there was nothing in New York State to protect my father to have a real relationship with his first son. And that's why uh, until I take my last breath, I will continue the fight. So every child has the opportunity, the equal and fair opportunity to grow with both parents. All right, some pretty compelling words there. And this is why we really need it to happen at the state legislator levels and not be left in the attorney's hands. Um, next up, I want to give away a couple more tickets to our exotic virtual vacation, I, I mean, uh, trip to Athens, Greece, for the International Council on Shared Parenting's conference. So this time we've got another um, trivia question. And it is, what was the most expensive divorce settlement on record? And I would like names and amount. And again, if you're Googling, I wouldn't know. So what was the most expensive divorce settlement on record? And uh, their names? <laughs> and their amount. So I saw sort of the answer for the name, although the amount is way off. So, ah, wait a minute. I just saw it. There we go. Fiona or Fion, Jeff Bezos, Mackenzie Bezos, $38 billion. And just to give you some perspective, the second most expensive was only 3.8 billion dollars only 3.8 billion because that's just like pocket change to jeff bezos right okay uh let's do one more of those um so the shortest celebrity marriage in modern times if you google this you're going to get a really old one but i i mean like in the late 20th early 21st century philip is are you saying your own was the shortest Shortest celebrity marriage. Is Philip a celebrity? Oh, wait a minute. You were referring to the previous one. Shortest celebrity marriage. Anyone got an answer? In modern times. No one's answering. Wait a minute. Am I not seeing the answers? I guess it's stuck for me. Oh, somebody said it. And you know what? I may need a little help from my... Uh, administrative person in the background several people probably said it and i didn't realize my chat wasn't moving it was britney spears and jason alexander and the marriage was 55 hours and on a, a humor note here i just have to share this one the shortest marriage in history was a kuwait couple in 2019 and it was for three minutes apparently when they went out of the uh, uh courtroom uh, she tripped and fell outside and the husband laughed at her and mocked her. And uh, she went back inside and immediately demanded there be an annulment by the judge. And he granted it. So can't blame her on that one. Okay. And next up, we're going to welcome our Rhode Island couple who is going to share their shared parenting success story. We have Andrew and Chris that have joined us today. Hello. 
Hi, everyone. Hi there. Hi. Thank you so much for doing this. You want to tell us about your journey as co-parents and, and how you came to doing shared parenting? Sure. Um, we were in 2011, and it honestly, it kind of makes me sad listening to some of the people that spoke this evening because honestly, it was never even a thought that it wouldn't be that way. I couldn't imagine either one of us not being completely involved. It just, it would have been foreign because um, it's sort of all we knew. We're both teachers, coaches, and uh, we, we were just fully immersed in our parenting. So I think that was the hardest part of the divorce, coming to terms with what was going on with us between the two of us, but then also how would we manage that time with our children? So we were very fortunate. We both completely bought into that and we never swayed. And a lot of people I think look and think, oh, it's easier for you. Like, oh yeah, but that's different for you. And I think both of us probably chuckle under our breath because it was painful. It was sad, just like any other divorce. We don't compare our story to someone else's pain, but for the two of us, uh, you know, all we knew were each other. We were college sweethearts and, you know, we married and planned for retirement. So that was hard, but we knew our children really mattered. And we knew that we were going to have to figure out, regardless of the pain that we carried in our heart, we knew that we needed to be there for them. And, you know, we made a lot of accommodations and a lot of schedule changing and never really thought differently about it. You know, we've always shared Christmas mornings together. We've done Easter mornings still to this day. We'll meet and have breakfast. And, um, you know, our, our situation really was just built that way. We don't do separate presents for the kids. We still sign cards, mom and dad. Um, you know, it took a lot of work. Andy, you can share too. Yeah, uh, it was hard. I mean, now we're 12 years removed, but as Chris said, it was a ton of pain in the beginning and anger, and we didn't envision that we were going to be divorced when we got married in the late 90s. But I think we always we always put our kids first, and we realized they were young at the time. I mean, they were, they were our oldest son is now 22, and our daughter's middle daughter is 19, and the youngest is um, 17. So we all uh, we we were determined to put them first and not bad mouth each other and we felt like in the long run that was going to be what we wanted and it's interesting now that you know when I we go to games we sit together at the games and you know it's um you see some divorced couples where they they sit on opposite sides of the gym or the opposite side of the field they don't talk they it's 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 bad and in the, in the end they suffer and the kids suffer and that's you know life's short it goes by quick, Chris and I are in our 50s now, so it didn't seem that long ago we graduated from the University of Rhode Island back in the early 90s, but time goes by and and you got to look at, it, take advantage of the time you have with your kids and your, you know, your family and um, I'm still close to her mother, she's close to my parents. Again, it wasn't easy, it wasn't difficult, I mean it was difficult on her end and my end, but we got through it, so as Chris said, a lot. I think a lot of times people see us together now they say, oh, you got a maid, you're so lucky, like this happened. And they, they don't understand that we really had to go through the mud and the mud was, um, was neck deep at times, but we got through it. And I'm happy that we're at the point where we are now because our kids see the respect that we have for each other. So, yeah. Well, and you know, it's intention, right? You had an intention to make it happen. So you made choices and designed your life to accommodate that arrangement. I think one of the other things too, and um, it's a really important point. I know when we first got nominated to receive this sort of recognition, uh, the first time we spoke to the, the people on that committee, I really thought it was important to, to sort of make the point. It's not like, hey, follow these five magical steps and you too could be just like us. We had a lot of people that supported us and really encouraged 
um, growth. I think sometimes with divorces, you get a couple friends that think they're being friends and they stoke the fire. They go with the, I can't believe it. What a jerk, you know, they, they feed that. And maybe you need that for the first week, the first month, the first year. But after that, you got to get back on your feet. And there's always all oh, mother bear, mother bear with her children. But it's like, ah, you know, the bear's got to get up and learn. So some of the excuses that feed that dialogue, we were fortunate because we had support from friends. But then I think for the two of us, people always talk about do it for the kids, do it for the kids. For me, at least, it was like, ah, do it for us. You know, we were together right. before we had children. So it was almost like, oh, I still see you. Oh, right. Remember me? Right. Oh, there you are. <laughs> and it's not just the kids. Like, I think for us, it was like, ah, how do we get there? Yeah. And you know, the other night, my, my dad just passed away last week. It's been a tough time. And Andy was there with his family, parents, my sister-in-law, his sister. Um, that's important. So it takes time. You know, you can feed that fire. You can feed the, the, the good or the bad, the light or the darkness. You get a choice in this lifetime. He and I are both PE teachers. We've been coaches. And I think that was another part that was really important. Like life doesn't always work out. And I, you know, we're both tennis players in college and it was, I always compared it in the beginning of, we had a great first set, you know, our second set was shaky, but we still got a third set. We can't crack the racket and walk off the court. And I think for both of us, we can both be proud knowing, you know, we did it. You know, you think of yourself climbing, climbing, climbing and sad, a lot of tears, yeah. you know, a lot of shame, doubt, guilt, sadness, deep, sad. And yet at the same time, really trying to, you know, honor that, but also for our kids, um, be able to kind of show them, if we want you to be honest, if we want you to have courage and you to be brave, then man, we better do it. You know, we're the adults <laughs> and uh, we, we got to lead by example. So yeah. that's the so hard thing. So look, we have more questions than we can actually take the time to answer during this session, but I do want to at least get one or two questions in for you guys. And I'm going to bring Leanna, the uh, director of operations for National Parents Organization to um, help me with the uh, fielding of the questions. So Leanna, what's the first question for Andrew and Chris? Our first question is, did your kids somehow demand or influence equal time on your part? Uh, we just, our, our schedule, as soon as we knew this was sort of what was happening, that we would be getting divorced, I literally went on to Google and just Googled in shared equal custody. And I found a calendar right off the bat within hours. And we followed that. And it just always, we just stayed true to it. They're older now. And it sort of loosened as time went on. The kids were always involved in sports and activities. So um, we were very clear with just, you know, kind of putting our own lives on hold as far as, you know, driving to pick up, even if it's not technically your day. Um, we just we just did that. We, we really uh, kind of made it work to the best of our, our ability. Well, you know, you're a parent 24 seven, whether you have them with you or not. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. Another question. Who was your biggest supporter in your co-parenting journey? That's a good question. Um, probably, well, Chris and I had to support each other because we both, you know, we really were hands-on parents and it was, it was, it was tough. It was sad when, when they were with Chris in the beginning and I'm sure for her when they were with me, but we, we knew that both we could be great parents and we both wanted as much time as we could with our kids. So it was not gonna be a question, it was gonna be 50-50. But I think you, you talk to your, your good friends who you know really support you and, and your family and you just try to get through it. I, I know I have a lot more empathy for people that have gone through divorce because you don't realize how attached you are with so many different parts of your lives, Never mind if you don't have kids, but, um, but I think it, it really came down to Chris and I recognizing that both of us wanted to be with our kids 
as much as possible and working together to do that because if it became something different, then it becomes hostile and, and there's more anger and then there's pitting one against the other. And I've been involved with education almost 30 years, same with Chris. And we see kids, I saw a student the other day, I teach middle school, the students in fifth grade and something was, was up, wasn't right. And long story short, we talked to the counselor and there's a lot of stuff going on at home. So these kids, even though they're 10 or 11, they're hearing things, they're hearing when the parents are fighting and when they're arguing and, and they're carrying this baggage in. And it was just, it was so blatant. It was so obvious when I saw the student that I said, I, we gotta get, we gotta get the counselor down here and, and figure out what was going on. But it was, it was a home life. It's a broken home and it's not good between the mom and dad. So maybe that played a little bit of a role throughout this, you know, years ago. Um, I'm not sure, but um, yeah. So hopefully that answers your question. Thank you so much, Andy and Chris, for sharing your story. I think it's inspiring to hear how you've really um, designed truly your whole life around the, the concept of continuing your family, because just because the marriage ended doesn't mean the family has to. Okay. Yeah, I think one thing just to go along with that too, um, the support of friends and, and people in your life is huge because it was often, I know even for me, um, you'd, you'd hear like, oh, the poor children, oh, the poor children. And to be honest, you know, the telling of the divorce, sure, it's shocking, it's sad, but it becomes the poor children every day after. If you keep dragging that same negativity, if people are making that other partner feel bad, then if you don't have the confidence to still go to the event, go to the practice, go to the game, if you feel like you're getting judged, if you feel like being you made fun of, you're not going to go. And in that situation, that's what punishes the poor children. They start missing out because the dad's afraid to take them to that party because he feels like people are talking about him or the mom's not going to go to the game because oh, maybe the other moms aren't being nice. So I think that becomes huge. Our society has to really look that what matters is you want to help those people heal. Nobody knows a relationship that, you know, other than the two people in it. So that sort of primary, like Andy said, everyone else is on the periphery in the beginning. It, it really is because you have to figure it out. You got to figure out what works for you and, and life is long. So yeah. you got a lot of time that you're going to be together, sitting on a bench, going to a wedding, going to a party. Right. So you can heal it, the better. It doesn't end at 18, does it? Mm -hmm. I don't know how old your kids are, but mine are well past that. And uh, if you think you just got to get through till they're 18, I have bad news for you. <laughs> or good news, if you can turn it into good news. Okay, well, thank you so much. We're going to move on now. I appreciate both of you being willing to share your story. I think everyone feels it was um, so inspirational to hear it. Oh, thanks. Okay, and next up we have Jennifer Harmon. Um, and I wanna tell you a little bit about Jennifer. She's a professor of psychology at Colorado State University and a leading expert on child development and co-parenting. She has published um, a number of articles and books on the topic and is currently sought after as a speaker and consultant. And Jennifer also has a TED talk out there on YouTube, a TEDx talk, excuse me, about parental alienation. So check that out when you get a chance. Shared parenting is important. Um, for families, because we know that when children have healthy relationships with both parents, which includes quality and quantity parenting time with both, that it has better outcomes for children. When there's a presumption of shared parenting, it sets a norm or a, um, a general agreement and understanding that children benefit from having relationships with both of their parents. And that when a parent tries to undermine those relationships, that this is a bad thing for the child and it's not in their best interests. Now I study parental alienation, which is when a parent will take advantage of a situation like having primary custodial status, which gives them a lot of power, um, and they'll use that to their advantage to further harm and push the other parent out of the child's life. 
So when a parent has primary custodial status, which can happen when there aren't shared parenting arrangements, they can take advantage of that and engage in gatekeeping behaviors, such as blocking the child's access to the other parent or the other parent's ability to contact the child. They can control the narrative that the child hears about why they're not seeing the other parent as much. They have power in the form of decision-making over the child's outcomes and major decisions that affect the child's life that the other parent is shut out of. Now, ideally, if a parent does have that kind of power, they won't abuse it. But when parents are coercively controlling, regardless of their gender, they will often use their children as a weapon against the other parent and use their custodial status to their advantage. This is why shared parenting in families where there's high conflict can be advantageous because the child will have quality time that's protected when they're with the other parent who often doesn't have a lot of power in that family. And that time with that parent helps to maintain their attachment to them and can help offset or buffer the influence that the other parent is having on the child. Now, the rebuttable presumption of shared parenting is that if a parent is abusive, you obviously would not want the child to have a lot of contact with the parent or have contact with them that's supervised or monitored. Not destroy the relationship entirely, but to make sure that the child is protected from abusive behaviors. So in a, in a case where there's a parent who is turning a child against the other parent, making them believe that the other parent never loved them, abandoned them, is unsafe or unfit, those behaviors are psychological abuse. And in that case, it would not be in the child's best interest to have primary custody with them because their behaviors are abusive towards them. So shared parenting is a, is a complex thing that it, when we talk about families where there's this type of family violence, where you have a parent who is abusive, but it's psychological abuse. And it's more difficult and challenging to show in court or to other professionals that those types of behaviors are damaging to the child and can be harmful and that shared parenting or primary custodial status with the abusive parent is not in the child's best interest. But again, shared parenting in itself can be a buffer to help offset some of that in these cases. But when they become more severe, it is important to protect the children from all forms of abuse, including parental alienation. Thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy in all the, the talks and presentations that are being shared on, to, on this Shared Parenting Awareness Day. Thank you. Okay. So I'm going to hop right back into the next segment, and we're back to me. And let me just make sure you can see me once I pull up my slides again. Ah, see, I have to set kind of a skew to make sure that doesn't cover me. <laughs> okay. And I want to start off by asking you a question. So as we've done in the past, it should pop up. And what percent of the time do you have parenting time with your children? Just go ahead and respond. We've got a bunch of answers coming in. It's evening out a little bit. Okay. We didn't actually give a, an answer of 50%. We've got the 25 to 75. I guess I wish we would have done a 50 because I would like to know the answer to that. But uh, we do have some that have um, 75 to 100. And I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll now. And you can see the results. So there's an awful lot of you who don't have even 20, you know, 30%. So we've got some work to do. Um, and with that, let's go into my third and final segment. And I just wanna let you guys know, we're running a little bit over so um, hopefully you can stick around because I think this is the most important of my three C's. Um, and I think you'll find it meaningful. Um, so let me get right into that. Now I'm a step parent too. And I would say that step parenting is harder than parenting. 
honestly, because you have all the responsibility and none of the influence or the glory. Um, I want to share with you a real quick story. It's the very shortened version of a much longer story um, about my um, stepchildren's mom and I. It took us a good 10 years before we became amicable with one another. We had a very tumultuous relationship, which was very disappointing to me because I had all these wonderful ideas of creating my family 2.0, my son, their kids all blended and wonderful and everybody got along. And I had also already been through my ex-husband getting remarried. So I knew it wouldn't be easy because, you know, another parent intruding on your terrain uh, can be threatening. Um, but I was willing to, to see how this went, but it was really bad. And I, uh, ended up kind of pulling back, uh, from being present much for the stepchildren for, um, big portions of them growing up. And they were six and nine when I first started, uh, seeing my now husband. And so, uh, about 10 years in, you know, I'm like, this is hopeless, right? And it's just going to always be like this. And uh, something happened. My uh, stepdaughter came home from college and she had this Easter basket and she plopped it down on the counter. And uh, I'm like, oh, what's that? And she says, well, mom made these for the team. See, my stepdaughter played a college sport and she, her mom had made a whole bunch of these for the team and given them out to each of the, of the girls. And she said, well, she had an extra one. She told me to bring it to you. And I thought, wow, this is new. Uh, we're now going to acknowledge each other's existence. Maybe there's a little bit of opportunity here. Um, but I'm just going to let it sit there. And then later that evening, I heard my stepdaughter telling her dad that her mom caught a lot of grief over these Easter baskets. Another mom was all up in her face about it. And I thought, that's crazy. And you know what? I haven't even thanked her for the one that she sent me. Maybe I should do what I would want someone to do for me. So I uh, sent her a text because we weren't really ones to call each other. And I said, thank you for the Easter basket. I appreciate you thinking of me. And she responded, you're welcome. I'm glad you liked it. Very simple. No animosity. Perfect. We got through a whole exchange. And uh, so, you know, having heard this story, I was like, well, I want to know just a little more. And by the way, I think I should tell her, I think that was ridiculous what the other parent did uh, with getting in her face. So I said, I just thought you should know. I thought it was a very thoughtful thing that you did. And she said, thank you. In response in text again, thank you so much for telling me that. I really needed to hear it. And I thought, wow, that really got to her. And so I said to her, what did the other mom say to you? And she said that after she got in her face, it eventually came to her asking my stepdaughter's uh, mom, do you want to take it outside? And this is at a college sport. Now picture this, two middle-aged women fighting in the parking lot of some you know, college. It, it's just kind of a crazy um image in your mind, right? Um, who does this? And knowing that my stepdaughter's mom was also a college athlete and very fit still to this day, I said, uh, I, I thought, hey, here's an opportunity to connect with her. And I sent her a quick text and I said, well, I have one question for you. Could you take her? And the emojis flew. And that was a moment. It was a turning point in our relationship. After 10 years of not getting anywhere between the two of us. Um, and since that moment, our relationship is thawed and we can be in the same point together. We can be together in events or at celebrations. So don't give up. It's a hard road. And the trick is to say only things that you want to hear said to you and do only things that you want to hear done to you. And that's the golden rule. It, it really arms you with peace of mind, if nothing else, because it helps you focus on a solution rather than on the conflict. Remember that? Focusing on the solution, focusing on what's important. And it helps you to not focus on the other parent, frankly, if that's hard for you to do. Um, 
you know, think about it. I'm asking you to think of you and what you would want to hear and what you wouldn't want to hear. We don't always know or predict how another person will interact, but we certainly know what we would not want someone to say to us or do to us. All right. So that's, um, that's the golden rule. And this is your PSA. Consider this your public service announcement and instant karma, baby. Okay. So if you take nothing else away today but this, I hope this is what you remember. Live by the golden rule. Treat others the way you want to be treated, not how you feel they may deserve to be treated. And do this through your words and your actions. Okay. And since we're running late, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on these, but say only the words that you would want to hear said to you. And you can see the examples on the screen, which will help you understand what I'm talking about here. And do only things that you would want done to you. And there's a lot of simple things we can do to be part of the solution. Share a photo of your child with your co-parent. Thank your co-parent for doing something for your child or be the one that offers to transport your child to sports practice. Acknowledge without judgment a, an issue that a co-parent has with you. Ask how you can help make things better. Other ideas? I'd invite you to put them in the chat and share them with everyone. I've got some. I'll share those as you're typing away. Share something your child made at school with your co-parent. They may not get those things. Send your co-parent a Mother's Day or a Father's Day card. Mother's Day is right around the corner. Tell your child something nice about your history with their parent. There had to be something somewhere along the line. Dig down into your memory for that. And by all means, keep your commitments. Okay. So I hope that you can stick around for the rest of this because I think there's still some very valuable information here. And, and I see some of the great advice coming through these um, chats. Ensure the kids speak each night. Um, they're flying by so fast. I don't get to read them before they go to the next one. They just keep scrolling. But uh, take a look at that chat and see if it gives you some inspiration on how you can be part of the solution because you may not get the benefit of them being the one to make the first move. You may have to do that. Okay, and moving on. Uh, we'll go with another word from our sponsor, Onward, who made this possible today. There's a new way to manage your co-parenting finances. With Onward, you can share expenses, split payments, simplify communications, and more, all in one place. To get started, just enter your phone number and tell us a bit about yourself before registering for your free trial. Once you're done with that, Onward will send you a verification code, so be sure to enter that to secure your account. Next, tell us a bit about your fellow co-parent and we'll send them an invitation to download and register for Onward. Be sure to enable Face ID and notifications so Onward can make your experience as convenient and secure as possible. Now, tell us a bit about your children to help Onward organize your expenses. And if you have any pets, tell us about them too. Once that's done, you can start to use Onward. Simply add your expense to the app along with how you'd like to split them with your co-parent. Co-parents will get notified and can settle the payments right through the app. Just select the expense, how much you want to pay, and pick your preferred payment method. And don't worry, because Onward keeps track of every expense, so you can focus on what really matters. Okay, please check out the people of Onward who have supported this, um, pres this, this whole event today. And next, we're going to hear from Ashley Nicole Russell. And Ashley is a family law attorney and founder of ANR Law Firm. 
which specializes in high conflict divorce and custody cases. She is also a proponent of shared parenting and is passionate about helping families navigate the complexities of co-parenting. Ashley also hosts a podcast called Divorce Healthy, which is worth a listen. And it sounds like she's one of the good guys or women. Happy Shared Parenting Day. I'm Ashley Nicole Russell, and I am an attorney in Greenville, Raleigh, and Wilmington, North Carolina. And I'm here to talk to you about how conflict and divorce can be reduced through collaborative family law. And so I am a huge advocate for shared parenting. My parents um, did not have a shared parenting schedule. My dad was only allowed every other weekend and one night a week. And I believe that the conflict in their divorce could have really been helped if I had had access to both of my parents. Um, that's one in a myriad of things that I think could have changed. In, in addition to that is collaborative family law. I focus on that um, in my career. I focus on staying outside of court. I believe in that process because I believe it does help couples to be able to come to a common ground around custody a lot faster without a lot of the inserted adversity that happens whenever they join a litigated system. And so I believe that collaborative family law promotes shared parenting. And so in North Carolina, I do a lot of work around collaborative family law. Additionally, collaborative family law, the process through the International Academy of Collaborative Professionals was nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize. And so that's a pretty big deal. I think it shows the peacemaking ability of the process. And I think that that really dovetails into how the peacemaking process of collaborative really helps the focus of shared parenting because it does reduce conflict. Collaborative family law allows you to stay out of the courtroom by signing a pledge with both attorneys. Each um, person in the couple signs with their own attorney, the four people on the contract stating that they will not go into court. And so if those parties decide that they wanna to go to court, they of course still have that availability, but they would just need to find different attorneys than the attorneys they have in the collaborative process. That allows us to be able to really create a container around the process for the clients so that they're not worried that they're going to be cross-examined or any of the information is going to used against, be used against them in litigation. So we build what's called the container that allows the parties to communicate confidentially in our settlement discussions and the attorneys are not allowed to be um, brought in as a witness should those two people not be able to resolve their conflict and go to litigation. It is a very small, 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 small percentage of cases that do not settle in collaborative, specifically in my world. Um, that is an incredibly rare occasion to have a case not settle in collaborative at all. Most of the time, the parties are able to be very successful in staying out of court and keeping, therefore, their children out of court. And so I think that that's a huge piece of the process. Additionally, in the collaborative setting, in addition to the pledge that prevents the attorneys from going to court, the other tent poles of the collaborative process is that it's an ex open exchange of information, meaning that all the parties share all the information up front. We create what are Google Drives or binders that have the party's full amount of marital information in them and also um, custody information. That way we can make informed decisions between the parties. And it's an efficient manner. It basically gets rid of the telephone game. Uh, in grade school, we played a game where you would say something to someone, they would say it to another person and around and around. And by the time it got back to the, to the person who had originally made the statement, you could tell that something had gotten lost in translation. So when collaborative, you have all of those conferences together, the four people sit together in the conference, it allows for there to not be a mix up of exchange of information and allows for it to be a more directed communication. And it's an interest-based negotiation model, meaning that we're talking about what are your underlying interests instead of it being like a car lot where there's just one number and another number and, and, and working towards the middle or one number of overnights and another number and trying to work towards in even ground instead it is an interest-based negotiation model meaning that we really talk about what is happening between the parties and try to come to very lasting agreements that really focus on the children and um, their needs so happy shared parenting day very excited for what all is going on in the world of shared parenting especially here in north carolina we have a big bill this year so thank you so much for celebrating with us and i hope to see you in the future that's awesome. Be sure to check out Collaborative Divorce if you are still in the process and haven't already went through um, litigation and, and all that stuff. Okay, 
let's move on to Ned Holstein. And, and just so you know, we have about wow, maybe 15 minutes left in this agenda. It just uh, is always, it always goes that way. So let me tell you about Ned Holstein. Ned is a physician and the founder of National Parents Organization. He is a prominent advocate for shared parenting and has been instrumental in advancing legislation and policies that support co-parenting and family court reform. He'll be presenting the NPO Shared Parenting Research Award, and Ned lives in Boston, Massachusetts. Hello, my name is Ned Holstein. Thanks for joining us on Shared Parenting Day. I founded National Parents Organization in 1998, and I served as its chair of the board and for most of the time also as its executive director for over 20 years. Back in 1998, the outlook for children whose parents separated or divorced was bleak. It was almost certain that they would lose most contact with one of their loving and fit parents, usually the father. And the reason for this is that family courts, both the jurists, the judges and the attorneys, as well as the mental health specialists, were adamant that children needed to be cared for by just one primary caretaker. They had been taught this for many years by the so-called experts. Uh, one of the most influential texts of the time was written by three authors, two of whom were affiliated with Yale, one with the law school and one with the Child Study Center. And the third author was Anna Freud, daughter of the famous Sigmund Freud, who was a mental health clinician and practitioner. These were the highest credentials and their views were absolute and they expressed them without a trace of intellectual skepticism or reserve. As late as 1979, here's what they wrote, quote, once it is determined who will be the custodial parent, it is that parent, not the court, who must decide under what conditions he or she wishes to raise the child. Okay, so far so good. But then they wrote, thus, the non-custodial parent should have no legally enforceable right to visit the child. And the custodial parent should have the right to decide whether it is desirable or not for the child to have such visits. They supported this very dubious claim with the following, quote, children have difficulty in relating positively to or profiting from and maintaining the contact with two psychological parents who are not in positive contact with each other. Finally, just to be sure that this child could not possibly catch a break even as time would go on, they wrote, quote, as in adoption, a custody decree should be final, that is, not subject to modification. The most oppressing part of all this, of this Jeremiah, is that there was an almost complete absence of observational studies using sound methodology with validated measures of outcomes to support these draconian opinions. But this did not stop the authors from pontificating with absolute self-confidence. This maddening history illustrates why we are here today, the crying need for actual research on what parenting arrangements work best for children after their parents separate or divorce. We are fortunate that beginning in the 1990s, a body of valid and credible research did slowly begin to accumulate. And as Linda Nielsen's widely cited 2018 comprehensive review of this research literature demonstrated, the results have been quite astonishingly uniform uh, in their findings. Namely, that children do substantially better uh, on almost any measure you can think of or any measure that you can test uh, when they have ample contact with both of their loving and fit parents after parental separation or divorce. Now, can you think of any other subject matter in the social sciences in which the results have been so extraordinarily uniform. I can't. So this brings us to the matter at hand today. The 2022 National Parents Organization Ned Holstein Shared Parenting Research Award. And today we are deeply honored to bestow this award on two worthy researchers, Daniel Fernandez Kranz and Natalia Nolenberger for their inspired research publication titled, The Impact of Equal Parenting Time Laws on Family Outcomes 
and Risky Behaviors by Teenagers, colon, Evidence from Spain. This was published in the Economic Journal of Behavior and Organization, volume 195, in the year 2022, pages 303 to 325. This paper is a strong and valuable contribution to our knowledge. The authors took advantage of the fact that in recent years, certain regions of Spain, comprising about 38% of the total population, passed equal parenting time laws and the other regions did not. The paper is based, therefore, on relatively large numbers of observations. It is population-based, which means that the opportunities for count confounding are uh, substantially reduced, and it employs careful and sophisticated st statistical treatment of its data. The authors have found that in those regions of, pain, of Spain that passed equal shared parenting, um, equal parenting laws, there was a decrease in contentious divorces compared to other regions that did not pass such laws. They also found that risky behaviors such as drug use decreased among teenagers. And finally, they found that the relationships within the family improved with the father, especially among boys. This research helps us to counter bogus arguments that the mere passage of a law would actually affect judicial behavior because in Spain it did, and also helps us to refute claims that such laws would trap women in violent marriages. The findings, in fact, are consistent with earlier research by Fernandez Kranz, showing a decrease in the incidence of domestic violence in regions with equal parenting time laws. And the current findings, of course, also increase the body of evidence that such laws improve outcomes for children. For all these reasons, we congratulate the authors and thank them for their robust contributions to the well-being of millions of children and their families. Thank you for joining us today in honoring Daniel Fernandez Kranz and Natalia Nolenberger with the 2022 National Parents Organization Ned Holstein Research Award. That's some pretty incredible stuff, right? And we need to get that information into more hands. And I know that many of you have asked for the name of the study. And I think that, yep, it just, uh, <laughs> it was just given actually. So you can look in the chat there and grab that link. Okay, we're almost there. And thank you so much for sticking with us. So I just want to wrap up my four uh Points. I said there were four steps. There are three C's, but four steps to move from conflict to collaboration. And the fourth one is this, practice. Raise your hand. Actually, you don't have to raise your hand. But if you play a sport, how do you improve? If you play a music instrument, if you sing, whatever it is that you want to be good at, how do you improve? Practice. So... How many people like confrontation? Anyone here like confrontation? Put it in the chat if you like confrontation. I'm waiting. Yeah, I don't see anybody. So if, if you don't like confrontation, right, you probably try to avoid it. So how do you get better at handling confrontation if you avoid it? Look, you have to take it on. Practice makes perfect. And eventually, the discomfort will dissipate. Aristotle said, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence, therefore, is not an act, but a habit. So make it a habit. Here's your three C's and your fourth uh, step to practice. These are your takeaways. And look, I know there's a lot you cannot control about your situation, the other person, what goes on in their home, who they see. So you must focus on the things you can control and, and do that will serve you. Demonstrate civility, thoughtful communication, and care. It may just come back to you. And just remember, if you got nothing nice to say, don't say anything and treat others the way you want to be treated. Now, I want to share my contact information with you too. 
And um, I've got that up on the screen large so that you can take a look at it. And um, that's my book, Combative to Collaborative, The Co-Parenting Code. It is on uh, Amazon in three formats, paperback, ebook, or audio. And I also do co-parent coaching. If you want to know more about that, feel free to send me an email or give me a call or uh, hit my website for free information. I've got articles, podcasts out there, and that's all my social media. I'm pretty much Teresa Harlow123 in most cases, and 123 is my birthday. So now you all know, and you can send me a card. Okay. And uh, with that, I want to uh, let you know, I'm going to randomly select a couple winners of my book because I did promise a couple giveaways, um, but we're so uh, far <laughs> beyond our time. I don't want to keep you for doing that, but some lucky winner is going to hear me for five more hours speaking on my book. And uh, of course the, the reading is, is not very long if it only took me five hours to, uh, to speak it. Um, and I want to thank our sponsors. While um, our sponsors, I have those in a in a slide here. Hold on. <laughs> I've done so well the whole time. Our sponsors are Onward, the app, Gene C. Coleman Family Law Center, International Council on Shared Parenting, and Dad's Divorce Guide, a new book from Chris Batchelor. Thank you to Wildflower Events for making sure everything ran so smoothly throughout this entire Zoom and to the National Parents Organization for hosting and organizing this wonderful event. And we do hope you'll, you'll join us next year because we did say this is an annual event. So next year on April 26th or thereabouts, depending what day that lands, you'll probably see an announcement for the second annual International Shared Parenting Day. And with that, I'm going to see if we have any questions from anyone that wants to hang on. Otherwise, thank you so much for your attention and for all the interaction that you, you gave in the chat. That's been great. And I hope you got a lot of information out of this. Thanks so much. Question is in the chat. Well, we've got questions on the Q and A, and Leanna, do I have you? Yes, you do. Okay. All right. So I know we have a lot of questions out here. Are there any in particular that you'd like to highlight before we sign off of this call? Um. So. One of the questions, uh, Teresa, is about your book. Does it touch on parental alienation at all? Um, so it talks about uh, that to some degree. It's not a main focus, but I think that a lot of the suggestions that I recommend um it doesn't matter what level of interaction you might have because it's about building that bridge back to them if it if it doesn't exist at all or if it's severed. Um, so I think you could still potentially find use in it um, from that perspective. What else we got? And just so you know, I, I just posted a poll um, up in the chat. I think I was supposed to do that before I sent everybody home. Um, but uh, if you could, on a scale from one to 10, tell us how we did here this evening, we would greatly appreciate your, uh, your responses there. And there's a couple more questions that you can answer as well. Do we have any other good questions? Lan, are you still there? Yes, I am. Sorry, I was reading through the questions. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, well, some someone did ask, how do we help bring awareness and make changes in our own states? I think I can, um, you know, recommend that you come over to our website, National Parents Organization. We offer a lot of uh, tips on bringing awareness, and um, so do our chapters. 
Yes. And that was Leanna Micah. Again, she's the director of operations for um, national parents organizations. So reach out to them and uh, figure out what you can do to become part of the solution in your state. Okay. And I'm just looking to see if there's any other comments or anything coming through. Well, thank you all. I appreciate it. <laughs> okay. Um, we're going to post this recording somewhere, probably on YouTube. Um, we didn't make a firm um, arrangement for that before, but we did record it. Excuse me. So um, if you want to share it with others um, that you think could benefit from it, please do so and give it a like. Okay. And uh, we really do appreciate your your attention and staying over with us. And uh, I think we'll we'll close it out there. What do you think, Leanna? Are we done? Yeah, I think so. Okay. All right. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a good night.